Formula 1's 2024 season is well and truly underway. We've had two launches today from Williams, the FW46, and from Sauber Stake, the C44. We're going to focus on the Williams launch right now, though. Will this historic team raise itself even further up the grid? They were 10th in 2022, 7th in 2023. What about 2024? Well, let's find out more by talking to Hayden Cobb and Philip Clear and great to have you both here. Hayden, whereabouts are you? Talk us through your surroundings. I'm currently working from home uh, just outside Woking, so I can probably hear the McLaren factory right now. But uh, yeah, so not, not far away. Lovely stuff. And what about yourself, Philip? It looks like you're in a slightly different surroundings as opposed to Hayden, which is home for him. Well, I'm, I'm also home, not in Hayden's home, but in my own home office <laughs> uh, in Barcelona, actually. So also close to... F1 or an F1 circuit, at least for the time being. Okay, well, look, let's go to this livery then, the FW46. This is not a, a dramatically different livery from the team. Similar in the way to Haas, not a huge amount of changes there. And we have seen this livery with the FW45. So let's start with you, Hayden. What are your thoughts, hit or a miss? I'm, I'm okay with it. I was hoping for a bit more white in terms of their return to when they've run, run the white liveries before. Obviously, that looks great when it was Martini sponsorship in particular. And they were sort of teasing it earlier before their reveal uh, with the race suits being predominantly white. And I thought, oh, that may be nice. But uh, as it is, they've, they've stuck with largely what they had last year. Obviously, it puts a few new interesting sponsors on too. So I'm okay with it, but I was hoping for more. All right. Philip, are you as um, less critical as I thought Haven was going to be? <laughs> it's all right, actually. It's, it's, it's a decent livery. I know people love seeing you know massive changes year on year and see something fresh and this is very similar obviously um, it's not bad i think the the white and red pinstripe really has a nice little detail and other than that like many teams they really want to keep a lot of surface black so they can keep it matte carbon save some weight that's sort of inevitable with these rules i'm afraid we don't really get to see any technical insight other than the way the car looks though so it's going to be uh, a waiting game for us all to find out now uh Phil, you've been to the, the media sessions today with Team Principal, with, with James Valls, and also with the, the drivers, Alex Albon and Logan Sargent. Now, um, as with all the teams this year, it's a static driver lineup, exactly as it was last time. But let's start with Valls himself then. Um, he joined the team last year. We shouldn't really forget that. It certainly made his mark on the team as well. He's a bit fairly critical as well about the team's performance, I think, over the, the last um, period of time he's been there. But at the launch, um, he spoke a lot about how Williams' goal isn't just looking at today or tomorrow, but looking you know, further down the line and into the future. It's long-term team strategy. And this is what James Viles said to you a little bit earlier on at the team launch. 2023 was our best season since 2017. And I had the fortune to be here as a part of the organization once we're on that journey together. And it sets the foundation, just the foundation for what we want to do going forward. What it shows the world is that we're not a team that's last anymore. We're a team that's on the journey back to the front. And we made a large step when we put that update on last year. That journey continues now. And what we need to demonstrate to the world is we're a serious contender that it's not one moment that we've moved forward, but we're on the right path back to the front of the grid. Well, Phil, you've spoken uh, to the team uh, about this idea of looking forward, which is I think, refreshing to see Williams doing just that. How is Vols looking to strengthen the team this year um, and also further into the future as well? Well, I think just coming from Mercedes to Williams, there's such a, a big chasm between the two teams that obviously he's going to try and and replicate some of the things that made Mercedes so successful. So it's clear that he's been very realistic about what it will take to get back to the front. He will take years. There's such a deficit in terms of infrastructure and staffing. And this is just another year where he'll, he'll, he'll try and put in new people, new new bits and bobs in place to try and, and bridge that gap to the top teams, which won't be easy. But he's got Pat Fry involved, who worked with, Messi, uh, with uh, McLaren for a long time, then with Ferrari, so he knows what a winning team looks like. And it's sort of... Not, not only infrastructure, but also just the mindset of, you know, personnel, what, what is the right attitude towards this? It's not about surviving anymore. It's about making progress. It's trying to, as Pat Fry and James Fowles both said, it's about thinking like a winning team, even if you're not there yet. So this is another transitional year, I think, where maybe we won't see too many headline results, but there has to be this tangible step forward, both on and off the track. What is a 
a tangible step forward, though? What do you think he's seeing as a tangible step forward? Well, if you look at Williams last year, its main weakness is that he's got a very peaky car that's only really competitive at a handful of circuits. It's very low speed, um, very aerodynamically efficient. So that meant it was really strong at tracks like Monza, uh, Canada, you know, lots of straights. But it wasn't good in lo- in braking per se or low speed corners. It wasn't good in very high speed, like long, uh, long high speed corners, very sensitive to wind and to different temperatures. So I think the first step now is to, okay, how can we try and preserve some of those strengths, but n- not be so peaky? Let's uh, have a car that's more all around. Because if you look at where it finished, Williams finished seventh with 28 points. But if you want to make a step to sixth, well, Alpine finished uh, sixth with 120 points. So it's still a massive gap if you want to move up. And the only way you can do that is to have an all-around car that's capable of fighting for points every single weekend. And I think that's what Williams' next challenge is, just make an all-around car that can compete everywhere. Which is lovely in theory, but it's not quite as simple as that. I mean, you've got to make inroads. Hayden, what are your thoughts? Very much the same. Yeah, it's, it's every every weekend picking up those points. They did. I think Williams deserve great credit for what they did last year in terms of that lower midfield battle, effectively coming out on top because... Like you say, yeah, if there was, say, I think six uh, tracks where they felt confident of of fighting for points, I think they scored pretty much at five out of six, if not all six of them, and really maximised their opportunities as well. It took the most out of that opportunity, uh, particularly with Albon, even, even Sargent picking up a point with disqualifications in Austin. But the problem they've also got, which I'm sure we'll come on to a little bit later, is to make that close that gap, they need both drivers scoring consistently points and and that's not what they had last year with Sargent so yeah not only an all-round car but an all-round driver duo as well to pick up points together so how do they do this Philip because as Hayden just says there you need both drivers you know um both adding points into the pot there Alex has done it proven that he can do it at this level and in Formula One uh, Logan needs to maybe up his game is it just a simple case of putting their arm around him and giving the confidence or, or what what can they do well, I think that's what they have done through last year, and that's, you know, giving him a new contract is the perfect sign of, of having that confidence in him and having that that support behind him. Um, yeah, I think that's just a, it's just a really big year for for Sergeant because speaking to him earlier, he's now had the time to reflect on what his year was like, and he said like, okay, my preparation wasn't right, I wasn't really physically where I should have been. And then with such a relentless 22 race calendar, 24 race now, there's just no time to catch up because you're constantly recovering and living race to race. So I think having that off season now to just focus on getting it right. He said he's, well, he's, he's changed his trainer, he's changed his training. Um, he's gained five kilos, which uh, I'm assuming is muscle mass. Um, so he's really done a lot of work to try and build himself back up and uh, we asked James Fowles about this as well, and he said, like, well, he looks way more confident now, having been through that experience. And the reason why he's still there is because, okay, he's made a lot of mistakes, and he was very inconsistent, but it, in the data they saw, he, he had pace. There were flashes of pace. He just made mistakes at the crucial time, so it didn't, um, it didn't translate into results. So they believe that he can now put it together, and now it's up to him to deliver, because... Uh, We've seen teams sack young drivers for way less, so it's it's all up to him now. We'll come properly to Logan Sargent in a bit and hear his thoughts as well. But Hayden, when we look at their driver lineup, Alex Albon, his driver, you know, he's he's been around for a while now and he's had his ups and downs. He's been through some pre tumultuous periods of his career in Formula One. What can he do, do you think, to help Logan along this journey? Um, I, I think first and foremost, be be the benchmark, continue to perform like he did last year. As you say, <laughs> if, if Logan ever needs sort of to look through a comeback career in terms of a 4-1 stance. Alex Albon's got uh, yeah, plenty to, to tell him over that. Um, but yes, be, be the benchmark. Keep leading this Williams team in terms of development direction and in, in terms of, sort of pure results as well. Um, but yeah, Alex Albon's also probably been a driver that you would, you would say, particularly in those Red Bull days of where things were getting particularly difficult, having that um, crisis of confidence. And I think Sargent probably would internally at least be having been felt that sort of at various points last year particularly with those key moments um sort of crashes coming out and so yeah 
it's it's learning from those mistakes it's finding that consistency and and Albin is sort of the perfect person to look from that but I know that they sort of have a very, a sort of varying differing um driving styles as well which can obviously be difficult to translate instantly but just just learning through the data looking through what where Albin is strong and trying to sort of replicate that and bringing his level closer to Albin's level and that's always a tricky thing isn't it um Philip that when you've got two drivers with different driving styles and you're creating a car you can't create a car to suit both driving styles. You have to go down one particular avenue. And if Alex Albon's the point scorer, he's going to get the car built and set up for him. And Logan's going to have to adjust his driving style and technique. Yeah, but even Alex was not really enjoying driving that car. So it goes back down to getting a more consistent car that is good at different corner types. So you're not struggling on the braking or in, in various corners. So I think if they achieve their objective of making a a car that's more together, then that will automatically help not just Sargent, but also Album just to be more consistent. Like I say, we'll touch on this Logan Sargent topic in just a bit. But first of all, Alex Albon, he's now entering his fifth season in Formula One. Um, and that's not including his time as a test driver and, you know, in, in the Red Bull family. And we managed to catch up with him, or I think you managed to catch up with him, in fact, didn't you, Philip, earlier on and hear his expectations on the season and the car and its driving characteristics. The 46, the approach that we took was looking at our weaknesses from last year and realizing that without a big change, we're not going to, to fix them. So a lot of work and effort got put into changing um, or focusing on to the FW46 very early on. In terms of driving, I th actually think it's going to be quite difficult to, to adapt I feel like what I learned over two years driving the 44 and 45 doesn't carry across to most racing cars. And it was very easy to make mistakes in the 44 and 45. Um, whereas the 46 should be a, a much more forgiving car. On paper, the 46 should be much more of a complete racing car. So what you saw last year were these peaks coming in. When we look back and we understood why the reasons were why we were quick. It did make sense, um, but at the, in the moment it didn't. So let's see, maybe maybe our peaks aren't as peaky, um, but there are tracks, for example, like Monaco or um, Barcelona, which have always been very tough tracks for us. And they're the, the ones where, you know, last year was more about, we've got six races in the year that we, we can score points in. Hopefully it will be 24. Well, Phil, you, heard firsthand from Alex what his hopes were, his aspirations were for this season. Can you maybe elaborate on what he was saying about his hopes for the car, the performance, and, and how it's going to help him in different scenarios, what it means to both the drivers? Well, I think, um, again, as we said before, it's about having a better car across different circuits. And there is, you know, there is no, um, let's say, fairy tale going on at Williams that they will suddenly be much more competitive. But I think Alex also realizes that this is a long-term project and we can speak about his contract later because that's a different topic altogether. But I think for this year, again, if, if he can score points more regularly at various different venues, different corners, then I think that will give him a lot of confidence in the team that it is on the right track, as James Charles is trying to put it, and that it's a good team to be for the long term. And Hayden, with the fact that Mercedes and Williams are so uh, tightly tied, you know, with a new engine partnership that's going to last until at least 2030 and this new seat maybe being open up for Mercedes for 2025. We know there's going to be a seat available in 2025. Is this something that you think maybe Albon is is eyeing up uh, realistically for next season? This is no disrespect to Williams, of course, but if I was Alex Albon, I certainly would be eyeing up. But both both guys, definitely. Um, yes, it's... A curious uh, situation, obviously, with Hamilton off to thrive from, from 25 and gives Mercedes, sure, it's, it's going to be one of the most hot, uh, hotly contested seats available, with probably the exception of the second Red Bull seat, uh, depending on Perez's future, for, for the entire season. they You would say Mercedes don't need to rush into a decision um, necessarily because like their options will largely remain as they are between now and the end of the season. Um Albon is obviously one of the candidates that's been talked about. Obviously, the Williams connection makes a lot of sense. Mercedes' last two uh, driver recruitments have both come from from Williams. 
Valtteri Bottas, obviously, as the very, very late Nico Rosberg uh, replacement, uh, which was probably a bigger headache, <laughs> or must have felt it at the time for Toto Wolff, uh, trying to replace the world champion. Uh, and of course, George Russell, who did his uh, year's uh, apprenticeship, you could say, at Williams, uh, and then got, obviously, promoted to to Mercedes. Um, so there's logic to it, and, and you can see why people have made the comparison, and you can equally see why Williams are sort of going, no, 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 he's our driver confirmed at least until the end of 2025. But I, I would also ha- say that so was Lewis Hamilton at Mercedes until he activated his release course. So there's, 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 I'm sure there's plenty of things that can be done uh, to to loosen that. And maybe this is Williams' tactic. Like, if you're going to come for Albon, you, you need to sweeten the deal quite a bit um, because he he is the driver they've invested in uh, very in the last sort of 12 18 months and and he was their he's their lead driver uh, they knew that Russell was was going to Mercedes and they put a plan in place to say right we need another driver with a few years experience trying a few cars and now is making the time to step up and be the lead driver if Williams were lose early driver much like Mercedes losing losing Hamilton they need to find a a ready made replacement that that cannot be Logan Sargent or at least on the evidence we have right now uh, that won't be Logan Sargent now of course you, we go down to a uh, hypothetical of he leaves who joins and that that conversation will probably never end um but it's it's feasible you would say that Alan should be looking at that Mercedes C and if he does sort of perform above and beyond a little bit like he did at parts of last season that states his case for Mercedes even stronger but uh it's in his hands but I wouldn't say it's a <laughs> anywhere sorted yet there's a long way to go Philip on that one how good a fit do you think Albon would be at a team like Mercedes? I think he would be a very good fit because he's clearly just learned so much from being promoted to Red Bull, arguably a little bit, a little bit too early, just failing there, having to rebuild himself, take a year out and, and go to Williams. And we've seen now he's really you know, at the peak of his powers, uh, just dragging that team single-handedly to seven. And not only that, but he's a very intelligent guy, very calm. He's He's got a lot more experience now. We've seen Mercedes in the past. They're not too keen on rookies. They've had George Russell at Williams for three seasons to, you know, to, to really mature as a driver and as a person. And Albon seems like a good fit on that front. He's, he's ticking all the boxes. You know, James Fowles has been quick to say, hey, hey, he's been signed up until 2025 because it wasn't entirely clear what his situation was. Um, but then if you ask Album, you know, does that mean you'll definitely stay until 2025? He says, well, time will tell. Let's see. So it doesn't seem as, as watertight as, as you may be, you know, as you might, might think. It was, as Hayden said, the same with Lewis. We thought he was locked in and it wasn't. So with Mercedes and Williams being very friendly, maybe there's a deal to be done. Um, certainly. When Fowles was asked this question, does that mean like you would stand in his way? He said, well, would I stand in his way? I'm just going to think about the long-term future of the team, not the short term. And it's not about one individual. It's about the whole team. So that that sort of leaves the door ajar, in my opinion. And often when you see a driver go through some very, very low lows, they suddenly become a much more rounded driver, don't they? And they can deal with the ups and downs a little bit better, Hayden. Definitely. You would certainly say all the experience that Alvin's got, highs and lows, as you just said, um, puts him in good stead for, for potentially what would come to join Mercedes. And we know he's got a good personal relationship with George Russell. So in terms of a teammate dynamic, that on paper, <laughs> on the face of it, looks looks great, I'm sure, as a like in terms of a marketing thing, also is uh, a bit of a dream. Um, but I guess it's that question of putting him back in a top team. And he's had the chance to shine at Red Bull and it, it just didn't work out uh, unfortunately for, for him um, has he sort of learned it got that experience to to do it again and, and sign out it's not often that drivers would uh, in so let's say in Albon's um, position get two opportunities at a top team like that I, I mean I'm struggling to think of one off the top of my head in terms of recent times that say hasn't flourished on the first attempt so yeah it will be fascinating to sort of see basically what he does over the first few races, first half of the season, uh, and how much his name is uh, constantly in the conversation when it comes to replacing Lewis Hamilton at Mercedes. I mean, here we are, we've just been discussing pretty much 
Albon to Mercedes, like it's a done deal. Like, you know, it's definitely happening. But just finally on this one here, um, if it were to happen, would Albon, and I'll come to you on this one, uh, Philip, if Albon were to go to Mercedes, would he be happy with being a Bottas or a Perez to George Russell? Or would he want to be that number one driver? Well, I, I think it's different because he's not slotting in alongside Lewis. He's slotting in alongside George, who is, like Hayden said, is a good friend of his. They race together in the Formula 2 and growing up together in karting and then what have you. So I think they very much see each other as peers, as equals. Of course, George has wouldn't have a leg up as being at Mercedes for a long time. But I, I, I don't think there would be a clear number one if that were to happen. Okay. Okay. Well, let's move the conversation back a bit to Logan Sargent. As we said, he's no longer a rookie. He's entering his second season in Formula One. He got that solitary point at Austin, Texas last year. And here he is reflecting on his rookie season and what that does to impact this season. I think the biggest thing I've learned is, well, it's nice to have a year under my belt. I know everything that I'm, you know, what what to expect, um, everything that's going to be coming at me. So that's already a huge, a huge benefit compared to last year. Uh, but at the same time, I also learned you really have to maintain yourself and manage yourself over the course of a season, which um, I probably didn't completely understand going into last season and um, something I definitely want to, you know, be better at better at this year. Um, that goes for, for many things from trying to keep yourself physically in good condition, um, mentally fresh, um, emotionally fresh as well. So just a, a lot of things that I feel like I can manage better um, to, to keep performing consistently better throughout the year. Well, Phil, you heard from Logan earlier on, and we have kind of touched on this already a little bit, but what are your thoughts? What are you, the sense you get from him about what he is going to do in 2024, what he's going to do and what he hopes to do in 2024 that are going to help push this team forward? Yeah, I guess we've mentioned the physical transformation, if you like. Um, I just think Franz Doss always said a driver needs three years to adapt to F1 to become a proper driver. And I think Logan's learned the hard way of how demanding F1 is, not in terms of underestimating it, but in terms of just, just you know, it all sort of happened to him across the season. And it was really hard to find the time and space to not only to bounce back from that, but just to just to stay in one piece mentally and physically. He's, he's now got that experience of having been everywhere, having been through such a grueling calendar that I think he can focus a bit more about um, focus a bit more on his driving rather than just having it all happen to him. You can be a bit more on the front foot, I think. And well, hopefully for him, the car will be a bit more benign, will be easier to handle, and that should help him as well. But I think having received his second chance at Williams, I think will will do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of making him at ease and just making sure he can really just focus on getting the most out of himself now. Okay, well, it'd be interesting to see what happens this season. Looking through the slightly wider lens than Hayden, I mean, we look at Williams last year. They finished seventh overall in the Constructors, 28 points. That's their best result since 2017. Can we realistically expect them to push themselves further up the grid this year? Or is it going to be something we'll see bubble over maybe in the next years afterwards? It's, it is a huge ask. And given that the rules are largely stable for this year and, and the deficit that they had to just Alpine above them in six places, as Phil mentioned earlier, is it's a massive gap to to bridge. It'll be interesting to see when they fully reveal their their new car uh, in Bahrain for the preseason test, what, what sort of changes they've made to make this sort of consistent behavior and consistent feeling. Um and whether that can put them in the realms of that and if anyone else dropped the ball to, to do it. I, I would say on what we get the information we have right now, no. So, um, consolidating and sticking sort of seventh place has to be their, I guess, their target overall and hoping that, yeah, with both drivers consistently scoring, they can close that gap to potentially have a sniff of, of higher up. But, but definitely no lower than than seventh would be the the option for them. And then having that, as as you've said with James Vowles, having that long-term project and vision of looking to the rules reset and looking at the opportunities ahead that are, are going to be greater when they come to sort of 2026 time. All right. Well, we see how the season pans out, gents. Before we go, finally, this one word hit miss on the livery that they have given us. Start with you, Phil. Hit or a miss? Maybe you can go a little bit further into why you like it or dislike it, and then we'll we'll wrap this one up. It's a slight improvement on last year, so I'm going to call it a hit. Oh, a tentative hit, Hayden. I... I think it's too similar to last year. So miss for me, 
It's just there's nothing ex- that exciting that we've just seen from before. Well, just leave it there. Thank you so much, gents, for casting the right over the Williams launch. Don't forget, we've got the Sauber Steak launch coming up as well. That happened today too. And don't forget as well that we've got Alpine coming up on Wednesday. And on Thursday, we've got Red Bull or Alpha Tauri or whatever it is they're called at the moment. But until then, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.